shoot. Yes, uh, it was probably one of the longest uh, awards uh, that I've ever heard of, uh, but a very nice one. Um, he co-founded a, a visual effects engineering company called Jixi FX. Um, he uh, earned an NSF award. His primary research is on physics-based modeling and simulation of computer graphics and uh, computational engineering science. So effectively, he simulates all the stuff that's over there, um, which has apparently been widely adopted in visual effects. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'll let you start. Thanks a lot, Kiss. And it's really glad to be, to be here to share some of my research in graphics and visual computing to you guys, which uh, I believe is not one of your current areas. Um, I hope um, we can find something um, mutually interesting to, to both of us and uh, we can do some collaborations uh, in the future if possible. So just, just a quick broad overview of this field that I work in. That's a physics-based simulation for animation and video effects, even though it can be used for other applications as I'm gonna cover, but essentially most people still consider it computer graphics. So we're mostly interested in doing the solid and fluid dynamics through solving the governing partial differential equations using numerical methods and scientific computing, parallel computing, HPC techniques. And uh, stuff includes jiggly, um, jiggly rubbers, closing dynamics, hair dynamics, uh, human muscles, human skin and fat, flash water, turbulent smoke, flowing sand, snowball fight, melting chocolate, and all those cool effects you see in the big screen and also in some other simulation-based engineering science. In uh, computer graphics and often case in the movie industry, simplified physics is often used to kind of distinguish us from computational scientists. That's a joke. So, <laughs> so for example, in this shot, um, you can see that there's some height field evolution to mimic the snow dynamics. The character is dragging, getting dragged out of the snow, but it's not really realistic. So people tend to add rigid body dynamics to, to mimic those chunks. But still, this looks like rock, not snow. It's not powdery enough. So in graphics or in Disney Studios, they also add those passive particles to, I don't know whether it's uh, clear enough there, but those is to like non-physical, just advecting particles on some velocity field to mimic the powder effect. So while these effects are quite are accept, acceptable to some audiences, <clears throat> and maybe to, to us for like five years ago, 10 years ago, um, it's very clear that if we add in more rigorous physics, um, the visuals can be much more realistic. Mm -hmm. And this is just difference between doing things correctly than compared to doing some simpli simplification. If I may interrupt, was mm -hmm. the top one what they did before you talked to Disney or, or before? Yeah, that was the earlier shot of the development of this Frozen. So the so Frozen storyline and, uh, and the character animations were done with effects like that in the beginning. And then we collaborated with Disney and made it like that. So, but this, is, this requires doing physics rigorously, like for just like computational physics research. So a common excuse we graphics people will say is that, oh, to have that accurate physics simulated, you need a supercomputer and need some funding from the military to, to be able to do it. <laughs> and Disney certainly doesn't have that money. They have uh, just normal workstations, PCs, for artists. So that's a common excuse. Maybe it's, it's good for 20 years ago, but let's look at the leap in computational platforms, because if, if the computational power is the problem, then we should be able to tell. So maybe that's true in 10 years ago. But let's look at this 2017 um, data where you can just get a $5,000 engineering workstation with, with 19 teraflops for computational density. And just with $25,000, you can get a Rackman server with over 100 teraflops of peak performance and huge aggregate memory bandwidth. Uh, maybe this data is not that uh, intuitive, but if you look back five years from 17, if you look at, at 2011, such a server that's worth $25,000 in 17 would be on the top 500 list of supercomputers. You can actually find such a configuration there. So it's, it's really a huge leap in the computational platform. If you need a supercomputer in 2011, in 2017, you can just buy it with this. And things are even more exciting with, with general purpose graphics cards. So today you can buy a single $5,000 NVIDIA card with over 100 teraflops. That's a trillion floating point operations per second. 
So it's, it's not really a good excuse anymore for computer graphics to, to not run uh, large scale expensive simulations because they are not expensive anymore. So observing this leap in, in platforms, um, the, the computational platform is, is definitely apparently advancing to the next generation. So it's a timely opportunity for computer graphics to take advantage of both the rigorous physics modeling together with the fast hardware to do something that, that is much harder uh, in the past. And concretely, there are four challenging aspects or, or four uh, important research areas to it. The first one is geometric flexibility. This means that a physical simulation needs to be able to deal with really complex geometry and topology change. Uh, it's not it should include um, 3D stuff in 3D and two-dimensional manifolds in 3D, one-dimensional manifold points, and, and the transition between these representations. The second one is physical accuracy. So this is really important because, as we already see in the frozen example, it, it not only improves the visual plausibility, um, but also, in fact, as I'm going to talk later, it's going to allow computer graphics to be predictive for real-world non-entertainment applications, um, broadly in general engineering and uh, science areas. A third challenge is to develop a unified framework um, that allows the mixture of materials and different phenomena to be simulated together. Because in the past, usually, um, there are some methods for, for class or some methods for fluids, some methods for um, class influence. All these things are not really um, done in a unified framework that makes it extremely hard to deal with multi-physics uh, where really complex, co complex uh, reality is happening. And finally, massive parallelism that will allow us to, to, allow us to do real-time real applications for, for stuff like VR, AR, um, and, um, and also large-scale predictions um, in, um, uh, with supercomputers again. So here I'll, I'll review these four aspects on some existing methods because I'm going to talk about some new method. The first one is just mesh-based simulation where you represent the mostly usually the solid object with with a tetrahedral mesh or hexahedral mesh, um, as in finite element methods. Yeah. Uh, is, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question of scale that you're modeling. You know, mm -hmm. it's like. Uh, for the Lagrangian mesh, you know, they're not going to be modeling interactions between atoms. No, it's, macro, it's all microscopic. Microscopic, but yeah. there are different types of, you know, if you're looking at something from 1,000 feet up away, so you can see like small details, are, are they different? That's still microscopic. So basically, if you go larger scale, say, uh, so later I'm going to show avalanche simulation or some like ice sheet in the uh, Arctic Ocean, those things there are, these continuum models still apply there. However, if you go to microscopic for the molecular dynamics, so that's totally what's different. The, is there, what's the breakdown? What scale do these things like this um, Basically, these, these things are restricted to Newtonian dynamics. So if you, if you go anywhere close to the quantum limits, then things become different. Or, 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 yeah, or uh, like chemical reactions. That's where you have to consider smaller particles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in, in computation mechanics, this is generally inside continuum mechanics, where you're kind of assuming um, every object in the world is taking a continuous space. There's no gap in between, which is a uh, is good enough approximation for, for classical mechanics. Okay. So um, Lagrange meshes, um, these meshes, um, the, the most typical one, in, within this this kind is finite element method. It can be very accurate for solving the differential equations, but when when the object, say a solid object, is taking a really large deformation where it needs to fracture or or as a fluid when it's to merge, uh, remeshing and dealing with the collisions can be really hard with meshes. It totally becomes a computational geometry problem. It's also common to solve things on a grid. So this is very popular for fluid dynamics, where it's really natural to, to say you are calculating the velocity and density of some fluid at a certain space location throughout the grid, rather than tracking some uh, particle motions. And it's also good for parallelization, because the, the grid is regular. 
so things are structured, you can fit into the, the cache in a very efficient way and do all those parallel computings with a very trivial effort. However, doing a learning grid, since you don't have the exact uh, explicit representation of the material, uh, it has problems with conservation and tracking the interface. So if you are simulating multi-phase mixture with water and oil, it's, it's, it's even a hard problem to track where the interface is, unless you use, um, then people use level sets and, and other different approximations to those, and which could further introduce other problems in mass conservation. So there are other methods that couples the ground meshes together with Olaren grids. That's very common for um, applications like fluid structure interaction. And unfortunately, if you are just using um, one of those two for, for this coupling, then it will inherit all the disadvantages in both of the above algorithms. And the resulting coupling strategy will, will highly depend uh, on the application. Finally, there are pure particle-based methods. Uh, particles are quite flexible in representing all kinds of materials because the real world is made of particles. Even though we're doing macroscopic, we can consider each particle in the simulation to be a chunk of real atoms, but, but just like scaled into the macroscopic level. However, most particle methods will suffer from inaccuracies because, and numerical instabilities because really the discretization will highly depend on the distribution of the particles. If things are not uniform enough, if things are coplanar in 3D, things like those will cause pretty horrible numerical artifacts. So we look at this table, and we can observe that maybe we can combine the Olaren grid, uh, which is good for those two aspects, together with the particle methods, which is good for um, geometric flexibility and uh, unifi unification. If we combine those two, maybe we'll have some methods that can, can have all the benefits. So that boils down to the so-called hybrid particle grid methods, or hybrid Lagrangian Olaren methods, with uh, dual representations using both the particles and the grid. Uh, when we generalize it to a, to a solid continuum, uh, the resulting method is called the material point method, or NPM in short. I didn't invent NPM, it was invented by uh, in Los Alamos National Lab in, in the 1995, where they were generalizing, where they were generalizing this particle in cell method, which was broadly used for fluids and plasma physics into solid mechanics to let it handle more general uh, continuum materials. So just as the name suggests, NPM uses a, a grid to handle the discretization of the PDs, just like the Olarin methods. And then the communication between the grid and the particles essentially uh, relates the coupling geometry to the numerical scheme. Each particle actually represents a chunk of material models, as in particle methods, and these particles interact with each other indirectly because they all talk to the grid, so that they talk to each other through the grid. In this way, the power distribution is no longer sensitive. Um, the accuracy of the solution is no longer sensitive to the particle distribution. Particles are merely like quadrature points for approximating those uh, physical uh, occupation of the space. And essentially, MPM uses a deformation map between a material space omega zero, some undeformed space, to a world space omega t and, and any time um, t. This phi map take the, the uh, original location X and T and maps it to a new location. And NPM further takes updated Lagrangian framework that is different from finite elements. Basically, it assumes an intermediate state at the current time, Tn, um, like the, the middle plot. As things evolve, the deformation is then partitioned into a previous state and the next state. So the physical equation is actually evolved forward in time by updating the deformation from a previous state to the next state, rather than recomputing from the original state. This way allows it to track a really large deformation without having to, um, having to remember the original shape. Because for a lot of materials like sand and water, it doesn't really make sense to, to have some rest shape in the, in the original space. I'm going to skip the algorithm details of NPM since it, uh, it takes uh, a whole semester. I have a graduate class teaching the entire NPM. Uh, the takeaway is that through interpolating physical quantities back and forth between the two representations, NPM can handle the interaction between any solid and fluid materials implicitly. So the, the interaction of the 
The induction of the materials is very common for, especially for granular media, like sand, mud, uh, snow, and fluids, and water. And maybe the, the interaction between the two. And unsurprisingly, through, through uh, collaborations uh, with Disney, the NPM simulations are more and more common in the big screen. So is it Disney making this, or is it like, Universities running. We're so like um, we're we're doing this in the labs, and then we send students to studios to implement it in their pipeline. Uh, that that's one approach. Another approach is we do a startup like the one I did. Yeah. Then we then we sell the software to studios. <laughs> uh, so now we go to more detailed research for me at Penn in the past three years. I uh, have been focusing on these six threats. Um, I will use the two examples in numerical scheme development and uh, versatile physics development to give you an idea on, on the things we explore. And the overall goal is just to give you a very broad view of this research field in visual computing. And hopefully we can get some inspirations and, and explore some um, opportunities. So let's start with the <coughs> numerical scheme research. This representative project I did uh, two years ago is called Moving Least Squares Material Point Method. It is a research that enhances the numerical discretization of NPM through some new mathematical formulation. So as mentioned just now in NPM, both the particles and the grids are used, and then information is transferred back and forth. <clears throat> now, there have been a lot of work purely on, on improving the particles like introducing new physical models into the particles, and some work on the grid, like using more efficient sparse data structures that better utilizes uh, memory, cache, uh, locality, and all those. And this work, like many previous work, is about how information is transferred between the particles and the grid. That is a key topic for improving the accuracy and robustness of the solver, because within NPM, every computational step is essentially transferring mass and velocity to the grid, transferring force to the grid, interpolating, interpolating velocities back to the particles. Every operation can be written as transfers, like a loop over particles or a loop over grid nodes. And when talking about NPM, um, many people just mention uh, particles and grid. However, that's this, these two are already discrete representations of what's really going on in the, in the simulation. Um, there is another important concept you're really missing in the discussion, that is the continuous field approximated by these discrete particles and discrete grid nodes. And in fact, the continuous field is where all the physics happen. If you have the discretization that's consistent with the, the, the continuous field, that converging to the continuous field, as you go more and more accurate, then it's a good method. And essentially, NPM is just such a discretization method that projects the continuous quantities like velocity, uh, in terms of uh, position to the particle representations and the node representations. So to see through the, the, the appearance and, and try to perceive, perceive what's really going on, let's start with some high school math. Let's say we're given some data points in 1D and we want to reconstruct a smooth curve to fit them. Apparently this is an under-constrained problem and there are many possible solutions. One guess could look like this. Another guess could look like this. They're all um, correct guesses. So we can, so to, to, to restrain the solution space, we can regularize it a bit. So maybe it's a good to constrain our choices to only constant functions, like fx equals to b. Um, of course, you want to pick one constant function that minimizes certain error. So we can use the least squares reconstruction error here, where uh, the, the function evaluation of the error subtract the data points um, with a um, squared sum should be minimized. <coughs> so th this error is defined as the total squares distance from data points to the projected points on the approximation curve. Apparently, uh, this red function here is not a good choice. Um, so let's move it higher so that the distance gets minimized. Now let's map it to NPM. If we consider the green dots to be velocity values on this one-dimensional grid. Um, this is exactly what's happening during the particle in cell methods, where 
the particle is at the origin, and we are trying to estimate the particle velocities by finding such a constant interpolation from the grid nodes. And of course, this as well will kind kind of boil down to just averaging weighted averaging of the green dot velocities onto the uh, the blue particle in the middle. But we are essentially fitting a constant curve as a, as a um, subspace. And during part of the grid transfer, the grid velocity will be overwritten by the reconstructed values on the particles. So this is why we want to minimize the reconstruction distance uh, when we were writing that um, least square formulation, because the smaller distance will mean will will um, result in better conservation of energy and less dissipation. But essentially, you are still losing a lot of information by doing such uh, transfer back and forth. Uh, so it's clear that using just using a constant function is, is not sufficient, really. So we can include linear function as well, which is this blue curve that goes across the origin of fitting these two data points, these four data points. We can, we can scale it to make it to make it match the slope of these points uh, using least squares. Then if we superimpose the constant and linear functions together, we can get a much better reconstruction. Uh, this is so-called the affine particle in cell method, where installed, instead of just storing a velocity on the particles, we also store information for the velocity gradient, uh, which corresponds to this curve. So that gives you each particle a much better approximation or representation of this local velocity field on the grid. Of course, we can introduce more bases to have a polynomial approximation per particle on the local velocity field. And velocity field is just an example. It could be arbitrary fields like mass, temperature, and all those other physical quantities using the same idea. It's really just projecting the, 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 the space from the grid to a submanifold on the particles. Um, in 2D, things get a little bit more complex, but the idea is the same. We can use the basis function, get least squares reconstruction, and we can pick uh, from constant to, to high order polynomials to increase this uh, the, the di dimension of this approximation space. Traditional particle in cell just uses constant basis uh, that has been the, the standard. Then the affine particle in cell will add the linear basis. So APIC was something we developed uh, in 2015 that already makes kind of reduces the dissipation by 90% if you if you do some quantified analysis for pick type of methods. And polypick further introduces bilinear and quadratic basis functions. And if the degree of freedom, if the function space originally on the grid is just a, a quadratic kernel, then using a quadratic basis will lead to lossless grid particle transfer. I mean, yeah. What you mean is if the particles are dependent mm -hmm. on like acceleration, if it's like mm -hmm. uh, uh, f equals ma, then in that case, you mean like, for, so in other words, for normal forces, this is lossless, or, or do you mean something? It means the transfer. So originally there was some loss as you are interpolating some velocity quantities from grid to the particles, mm -hmm. so that you can move the particles along this field. Yeah. But just purely from that interpolation, you are kind of losing a lot of energy already. Mm -hmm. Losing energy, losing angular momentum a lot. Yeah. So doing this lossless, you essentially conserve energy. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the physics. It's, it's merely interpolation. Yes. Yeah. The physics is, is entirely solved on the grid. Yeah. yeah. So that was using least squares. And actually, there's another way for, for reconstructing a continuous function, which is just use splines to interpolate. And you can use linear splines, you can use uh, quadratic, cubic, B splines, NURBS, and all those. So instead of using polynomials, we can use small splines at each node position. And this is usually called the, the shape function. Uh, as in, in these um, finite elements and material prime methods, or for each grid node, you have this kernel. Yeah. When you add these splines together, you get something like this. And this reconstructed function looks smooth, and, and it's really the classical way for discretizing PDEs um, using a weak form, using a Galakian weak form, as in finite elements. So we have two ways of reconstructing a continuous field of discrete samples on a grid. It seems that for some reason, 
uh, in parallel cell methods, we have been using the moving least squares reconstruction for the velocity transfer, like the one I just talked about between uh, transferring stuff from grid to the particle. But since we're discretizing the equation using a Galakian weak form, we're using B splines, like the shape kernels, for forced discretization, for approximating those integrals into, uh, into discrete summations. That corresponds to the velocity gradient because force is essentially, um, the deformation is essentially evolved with velocity gradients, and the force is a function of the deformation. So the natural question here is, can we use just one single interpolation scheme for, for both of these two uh, places? And if we can do so, maybe we can simplify the algorithm, simplify the math, and optimize the code. So we started with trying using, just using B splines for, for APIC for, um, for reconstructing the velocity field. And so instead of fitting a moving least squares quadratic function to the velocity field, we just assume the spline is a quadratic function and sum it up. And it turns out that doing so doesn't really bring much advantage. And in fact, it's uh, not only hard to compute, but also leads to the break of angular momentum, angular momentum conservation. So if you are simulating something rotating in midair until it rotates slower and slower, it can eventually stop as if it's underwater or something, <laughs> like, like, um, like feeling some air drag, uh, which is non-physical. So the other option is to use the moving least squares for approximating the force discretization as well. And that, lead, that works really well and leads to MLS MPM. Um, so moving these squares makes the MPM work together with the, with the affine particle itself for velocity transfers. And before I dive into a little bit of the math formulations, I want to highlight that uh, MLS MPM is actually even simpler to implement than traditional MPM because you do, you do not compute the velocity gradient using spline kernels anymore. You can directly take the velocity gradient approximation that you already do in the velocity transfers. Um, and in fact, we were able to implement this with either lines of C++ code, uh, which you can find on my homepage and play with for, for simulating you know, two-dimensional elastic solids with arbitrarily large deformation. <laughs> In this table, I summarize some elements of traditional MPM and MLS MPM. The table looks a little great, great scary, but I promise I, I'll just spend one minute on it. And fortunately, so most entries for the newly invented MLS MPM are actually the same for um, compar when compared to MPM. And in fact, the only difference as, as highlighted there is the momentum contribution, which is the force discretization and the evaluation of the velocity gradient. We're switching from splines to moving least squares. And uh, with MLS MPM, we can reuse the, um, this velocity gradient approximation we already do for the velocity transfer and reuse it again for uh, approximating this velocity gradient in the deformation update. So F is, is the deformation gradient, which tracks how how the material shape is evolving. And since the B spline gradient is uh, replaced by the much simpler uh, moving least squares shape function gradient, which is the linear function in terms of positions, rather than having to compute the gradient of the spline kernel, um, MLS MPM can be done much faster because the computation of a spline kernel over multiple grids and multiple particles is essentially a very expensive process. And it's actually interesting to see how these two gradient kernels are, look like. And in fact, if you take a quadratic B spline, take its derivative, you would get this piecewise linear uh, gradient information. And you can use that to approximate the gradient of some, some, some um, physical fields. Um, but the moving least squares uh, gradient approximation is actually smoother. And in, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's one order higher than the traditional quadratic B splines. So essentially without changing the, the range of this kernel will get a will get a high order accuracy accuracy through through the use of moving in squares. Now we went to the implementation side. So um, this line corresponds to the momentum contribution from the particle to grid transfer, um, where it's it's kind of transferring the the velocity gradient to the grid as the velocity field. Mm -hmm. 
And this line corresponds to the force contribution from part of the grid. And as you can notice here that in MLS MPM, we have actually unified this kernel contribution. They, are, they all look like the gradient uh, from moving this course. So numerically, that means we can merge these two summations into a single matrix vector multiplication, uh, rather than doing it two times and add together. So that will essentially half the required plops in the algorithm. Then we benchmark the solver against an extremely optimized standard MPM implementation, although it's also from my group. <laughs> and uh, the, the unoptimized implementation has a comparable performance. Um, then we do some low-level performance engineering on MPM through um, CMD intrinsics on the, on the C, on compiler level. That makes the transfers uh, 1.6 faster for particle to grid and uh, seven times faster for grid to particles. Then eventually, yeah. So, so just curious, I don't know very much about these methods, but what is the complexity of these algorithms? I mean, is all the improvement mm -hmm. based on just writing on GPUs and parallelizing it, or are there also algorithmic improvements? I mean, what's the basic complexity? Yeah, basically, when you. Is more than that? Basically, it's uh, there are a lot of data races because different particles could be aff affecting the same grid node. So usually, when we're doing these parallelizations, we, we would do some uh, domain decomposition and partitioning uh, manually by, by allocating these memories and transport them between GPU devices and all those to be able to efficiently um, make it it's parallel. Like in a square, in the number of cells that you have to consider. It's something? always O n, so it's, so these operations is always. Um, a summation of all the particles or a summation of all the green nodes. It's, it's linear on the number of yeah. particles. Yeah. This is also another reason that makes this, uh, the particle in cell type methods attractive because you can easily scale to extremely large scale with, uh, with clusters. Are there better methods? Are you doing more You just have to sum this. Is that like a lower bound? So it has to be linear because you have to count all the packets? So what do you mean? Can you make it faster than linear? Faster than linear. Uh, we actually have some ongoing project trying to use machine learning to 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 achieve that goal, like redu reducing the intervening space by you can if you allow certain errors, then you can reduce the, the manifold into a into let's say uh, two times small, smaller grid, then then use machine learning to kind of compensate the error between the two. But uh, that's that's a that's an open research problem. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so with with the algorithmic development we did to the mathematical formulation, we can directly get two times speed up just by having the flops and using better kernels. And that's that's kind of the first part of of um, MLS MPM where we. Kind of unified velocity and uh, force discretization from the PD point of view. The result is, is is pretty efficient and easier to implement because we do not need to implement the the derivative of ship kernels anymore. We're just using moving these squares. And algorithms like this also result in negative 100 lines of code um, because you kind of merge two kernels together. Now I'm gonna move to the second part of this work. That's called the compatible particle in cell. Again, it's uh, it's kind of improving the particle in cell in, in uh, certain ways. And here, suppose we have this armadillo model, which is really really common in computer graphics for simulating different dynamics and rendering. And for example, we want to cut it into multiple pieces. This is uh, the desired goal for for virtual surgery, where where I, I talk with a lot of surgeons that really want such ability for doing a surgical training software on, on virtual patients. Um, so this actually turns out to be really hard for particles. Because as you already know, when particles are close to each other, they, they, they spread to the same grid nodes, so they're kind of naturally cohesive. <laughs> and if we go back to this curve fitting problem, apparently the desired behavior is mature separation after the cutting. So if we are, we're looking at the velocity field, that means we want the reconstructed velocity field to look like this, where you have a really sharp continuity. The first left two points can move to the left with a negative velocity, 
and, and uh, the other two move to right with a positive probability. They shouldn't affect each other. And unfortunately, with the, the transfers <coughs> pick, a pick or a poly pick, any <coughs> transfer kernels, this is not possible because all the kernel functions are continuous. The green node in the middle will definitely influence all these four particles together and through some weighted average way. Like if we use uh, the linear kernel, using the linear basis, we get something like this. Um, so you get some average, yeah. So if I understand, it's sort of like if you were trying to cut a, a wad of gum or something like that, that, mm -hmm. it, that you couldn't physically, it would, it would basically stick together the moment you cut it. Exactly. Yeah, which is, I can see right here. <laughs> yeah. So in, in traditional NPM, there's no way you can simulate strong discontinuity for, for displacements or velocities. Um, so here I'm using a, a very thin level set for boundary condition. Mm -hmm. So you have to treat it as a collider. Otherwise, if you, it will get even smaller than the grid size, it's t totally ignored. And if you put the, the level set directly inside, it's just a boundary condition. There's no way things can separate. Another common approach in, in engineering is just to delete some particles so things can separate. Um, however, due to the, the fuzzy nature of the transfer kernel, a significant amount of particles needs to be deleted before the materials, before the particles can no longer see each other. Another possibility is to make the particles in between softer, but apparently that, that creates some artifacts as well. So from the NPM point of view, um, the relative motion of the two particles on both side, on two sides of a discontinuity is going to be smoothed out from the particle to grid transfer. They're going to spread to the semi grid nodes and get some average. <clears throat> and during resampling, during grid to particle, because the relative motion on the grid is already smoothed out by the kernel, the <coughs> particles will essentially gather some almost rigid velocity field and stick together. So that is good for preventing penetrations between the particles, but it's also going to prevent the separation between the particles. And unfortunately, there's no existing way that, that can avoid such smoothing. So we proposed a method to solve this issue by assigning each assigning colors to the to both the particles and the grid, uh, labeled with red and blue here. And we enforce that particles only interact with nodes of the same color. So you don't transfer or interpolate across uh, the, the assigned colors. And by doing this, there's no smoothing happening uh, at the boundary, so these two particles will no longer see each other. It's kind of uh, cutting the grid. So to achieve those, we, we introduced this colored distance field, which is a generalization of, of a standard signed distance field um, so that we can represent intersecting uh, geometries and open boundaries. So we start with a boundary mesh, like this, with three, three boundaries, three colors. Then we can rasterize the unsigned distance from the, the boundary mesh to the green nodes. You get different colors on the grid leveling the unsigned distance. With the mesh, you have different normal locations, so you can rasterize the color of the mesh to classify nodes to different colors to identify which side it's on, corresponding to each mesh. Then on the particles, we can, again, using the moving least squares to reconstruct the distance and the normal information. This is why this is also like part of the MLS NPM framework, because those, those moving least squares kernels are used again for the color, the side information, the distance information, and the normal vectors, uh, so that particles can, can efficiently know which side it is at. Uh, compared to the boundary geometry. And with all these includes, the NPM becomes much sharper. So we can incrementally cut a piece off, uh, or we can um, cut it instantly with multiple cuts. Yeah, this is a 2D simulation, yeah. Well, one question I have is, well, this could be very useful for rendering for visual <laughs> effects. Um, mm -hmm. Presumably, some sort of simplified version could be useful for gaming, for example. Uh, yeah. Are you, are you thinking about that? I mean, because obviously with gaming, everything's about speed, and it might not be easy for this to be done in real time. 
Mm -hmm. that, that's a good question. So for gaming, um, it's, it's really, if you don't want to change the algorithm, usually it's going to be a trade-off between speed and uh, resolution. If you take fewer particles, it's going to be faster, right? So um, the thing we were tested on, on a single GPU is that if you, if you want to simulate 500,000 particles with, with a sufficiently high resolution grid, or you have like eight particles per grid in 3D, you can do it in real time. So that's that's already beyond uh, what most um, real-time simulation methods can do. But of, of course, for games, you also need to include the time for rendering, for visualizing, and for for uh, player interaction and all those. Yeah. So the actual budget that can be all allocated for <laughs> for simulation is is much smaller. So the thing, like EA Games is down the street. Have you ever talked to them? I mean, have you ever talked to the game industry around here? Or uh, my my previous postdoc is is working for Tencent. I don't know whether you know it's a, a it's a Chinese company. They have a they have a research branch here in Santa Monica, and they are essentially using MPM for for doing for simulating their effects for for uh, mobile games games on the phone. So it's uh, I think it's going much much faster. Yeah, for me, my my major interest is still in. Uh, the movie industry. I want higher resolution stuff that looks like extremely close to the real world. And for games, it's sometimes much harder to achieve that without enough resolution. The remaining problem is just once we have those sign distance fields, sorry, color distance fields, we just need to assign the colors to the um, um, to the particles from the grid information. And of course, we can have the particles to gain gain the color. As it move close to the grid, since it's already smeared out on the grid, and uh, and, and as it interplays the color, it also interplays the unsigned distance field to to know its exact distance to the boundary. Now we can look at some 3D examples. So I'm just cutting this elastic bunny geometry with with four <laughs> with two thin blades. So this is meaning to demonstrate the the sharp discontinuity even at the crossing point of the of the of two geometry. So essentially, we will have four colors for these two plates. And this is cutting some uh, gold cheese mm -hmm. using some curved cutter. And again, when I was showing these two surgeons, they really just wanted to do it on, on virtual human bodies. <laughs> <laughs> But you have to put in all the material properties. Yeah, so hu human muscles and fat is actually pretty simple. There are, there um, are this. yeah, they do uh, mechanical engineers do experiments to measure the prop material parameters for the elasticity and viscoelasticity. Of course, you want to, to also include the fluid system, like the blood flow, that's much harder. But just for the flesh, it's, it's very easy. <laughs> and here you could like just tune something to make it stiffer, I guess. You know, the yeah. Yeah, it's all material parameters. And cutting actually also works for, for more natural phenomena, like, like blending the sand with some plate. So the, the sand simulation is another really important application of MPM. Um, it's natural, naturally particles. Uh, is this some sort of a test bench that you run the algorithm on? Or is it like a standard test that every test the algorithms? Um, a standard test doesn't kind of exist in, in this field because different methods have different targeted applications. But we're, we're thinking about creating such things because kind of my, my, my research career is to push MPM to be able to do everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like a question. Mm -hmm. like, so you're not putting in, for example, when you're doing fluids, but right, you're not putting in neighbor Stokes equations. It is neighbor Stokes. Oh, it is neighbor Stokes. Yeah, so, so basically your, your your stress comes from viscosity and the pressure, okay. just like uh, incompressible. Then right. you but I was trying to see, like you're simulating, you're putting in something, can you actually learn some new physics on the other end? So maybe for fluids, then mm -hmm. can you learn about like eddies and vortices, some of the more complex uh, fluid flows? Could you like see it and learn about it from just... Learn meaning like... Like real learning or machine like, learning? Like it would emerge. Mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, it will. Basically, it's... Physics-based simulations. Right. There's nothing new being learned. It's just saying, 
You can understand physics by simulating physics. So it's a direct numerical simulation. Right, but, that's actually, but, but, but some of the, like, you know, the turbulence, for example, that would be new, you know, that would mm -hmm. be maybe there's some, uh, was describing turbulence, you know, the kind of microscopic or coarse grain type. Yes, I have. A, I actually have a turbulent flow sediment transport example that I'm going to show. Okay, and right. that actually agrees with. But, but it's the physics simulation by, by definition it agrees with physics. Sure, but but it's a different <laughs> level. At a different level, you can actually like model and get the logical mm -hmm. laws. Actually, I mean, there's some. Kind of yeah, so for stuff like Navier Stokes, we can we really what we do is to take those um, 2D scenarios where you have the analytic solution, like those um, um, tidal green vortices, for example. Um, then we then we would bench up the ben benchmark the the code against those experiments to show the order of convergence uh, under time and space uh, refinement, and those tend to uh, agree with the analytic solution pretty well, and uh, it proves that NPM is uh, like a second-order method. For things like this, there's uh, just no way you can match the real world, because <laughs> real world is like a lot of randomness. <laughs> Simulation is too perfect for the real world. OK, so if we you will further enable the interaction between the boundary mesh as some rigid body and, and let it talk to the particles through some uh, force interactions, and then we can implement two-way rigid body coupling against NPM. This is a 2D example where I'm, I'm using a rigid water wheel-ish thing to couple it with uh, the dry sand. And, and this is a like, kind of a, a 3D version. So here, um, it's true. Now this is now Stokes. So in, in addition to simulating the viscosity and pressures, we add the incompressibility condition so that the material is not compressible, and it can uh, couple with the rigid body. Water wells. Um, One question I have, by the way. Um, uh, are you fitting in the same parameters as we would expect for water? Because although this exactly. is water like, like there, it feels like there's there's differences between this and, and real water. And maybe it's because you have to use a finite number of particles. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah. real, but it doesn't look, you can tell that it's it, it's, it's, it's computer graphics and not, not real. Mm -hmm. So. Is there some genetic law that you are trying to find out as far as why? So I think there are three reasons that it's not real enough. Yeah. One is the rendering. <laughs> I'm just yeah, it's just not doesn't <clears throat> even with a static picture it doesn't look real enough. Yeah. The second one is we are not fitting the real water um, like viscosity values oh, okay, and and all those. Yeah. So that could the third thing is the scale. So mm -hmm. if you are in graphics, if you are not using the real units. Say if the, the if the water well here is like 100 meters wide, <laughs> then the physics could totally look different from what you would expect. Oh, oh and, 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 and also also yeah. assume that uh, the the subtle interactions <laughs> like like the meniscus line those are not <laughs> easy for you to render, I assume. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But do you even get that actually? Meniscus line. As as you go h higher resolution enough, you should automatically get that. Yeah. Yeah, so the reason I wanted to do the rigid body interaction is for robotics. So mainly I was I, I was looking at this terror dynamics um, paper from Science, I believe, you know, where they're they're designing these robots to be able to walk efficiently on granular media, uh, send these to Mars or something. So with this two-way interaction, we can simulate the crawling robots in NPM entirely um, and study the the motion of the robot. So we first um throw some sand from the beach <laughs> then we then perform these two experiments by 3d printing this uh, designed robotic geometry on the sand um then doing so also allows us to use npm to 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 facilitate get the, the robotic design um at different leg configurations and shapes so then did you 
Or is your aim maybe to actually see if you can do better than that science paper? Say, mm -hmm. through pure simulation, we can find a better method? Or yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, basically, it's like a closed loop. Use simulation to guide the designing process. Evolve, yeah. and, like artificially evolve. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the purpose of doing these things. Did you succeed? Yeah, so for this one, we didn't. Essentially, we were, uh, so in the paper, we were measuring the, the, the walking velocity of this robot just uh, um, and it turns out to be to be um, matching the real world thing pretty well but of course the detailed uh, shape of the of each particle is not going to match the real world stand again partially due to the not being able to <laughs> know the real frictional parameters mm -hmm. for the sand whistle and and also the not enough resolution in the particles like numerical dissipations and etc so that, that concludes MLS, MPM, and CPIC. Both of them are, are pretty simple ideas and easy to implement. And the main research I want to show here really involves in, is just mathematically looking into how the numerical algorithms are, are representing a continuum. Really go back to the continuous description of a physical system. Then we can find ways to make this more consistent uh, when we are discretizing stuff. Now let's look at some other examples of uh, improving the numerical schemes. Oops. This one is spatial adaptivity. And the idea is pretty simple. You want to focus computational resources at places where you care, where you need accuracy, where you need uh, features and details. So the first example is two colliding cubes where you really want really high resolution at the boundary where interaction happens. And these two are where you're looking through very, very thin gaps or, or colliding with very, very thin geometry. So you don't really want to refine the entire simulation to super high resolution. That will be too expensive. Um, and the sand example is like an hourglass where you would, uh, we would use a higher resolution at the free surface while, you, while the sand is flowing. Right. And this actually so much is some of the work that um, a UFC professor was doing. He was doing work on, on uh, simulating um, uh, like quantum interactions, and you've seen like very high resolution uh, quantum interactions, and then in the higher resolution, <laughs> lower, like yeah, lower resolution, lower scale resolution. Kind of. mm -hmm. yeah. And that was how he was able to a, li a little bit like this, able to do very accurate simulations in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Um, maybe I could introduce or, or tell you who he is, and maybe. You could uh, see, if, yeah. We, we we could see if you could be able to collaborate. Okay. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's chat about it after the talk. Yeah. Oh, we have one minute. Oh, I have one left. Let me let me just show all the videos then. Yeah. <laughs> so another thing is the 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 temporal adaptivity where you want to take small time steps at where things are, where things require small time steps and jump, evolve very fast, uh, take large time steps at places where nothing really happening. And for large time steps, we're also looking at the different formulations of the elasticity problem. So instead of taking small sub steps, you can go um, into like a frame rate that matches the, matches what you need in a, in a real movie. Like one over 24 seconds per frame. And another point is, you know, of course, there's neural networks that are able to, for films, that are able to interpolate between frames of mm -hmm. the film. So presumably, this is where neural networks would be useful too. You do very fine resolution simulations at fairly large time steps, and then you might use a neural network to interpolate between those. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm very interested in exploring machine learning that way. <laughs> Then there's this uh, multi-grid thing. I think this is closer to the multi-scale thing you, you were talking about. Basically, you reduce the error, you know, cross the level, and then kind of refine it to the final level, uh, you know, hierarchical way. So this is this was uh, work doing done for improving the simulation of heterogeneous materials. We have extremely stiff bodies coupled with really soft bodies. So the the condition of this, the the equations are pretty bad uh, without doing that. Okay, so let's just jump to the videos.
so I wanted to give an example on the versatile physics. And the example here is for damage mechanics. I'm doing fracturing. Um, that's an example. So essentially, we're tracking some damage field uh, in the elastic body where blue means healthy, red means damage. And, and it's kind of uh, it's similar to temperature where you can. Then we model the, the um, loss of material strength under the damage. So that allows us to simulate um, this uh, dynamic fracture for for gliding geometries. And again, we'll, we'll take the armadillo. Instead of cutting it, we can uh, tear the limbs off. Almost every computer graphics paper will do something to the armadillo. <laughs> <laughs> it's human-like, but it's not grossing. And uh, then there's uh, um, uh, projectile shooting dinosaurs. But why are they all slime or jello? Yeah, it's jello. Yeah. yeah. We we'll have to do it like this, otherwise, it's going to be too disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even look at the, the damage field, it's already disturbing. Then <laughs> 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 there's uh, Okay, so this. There's other stuff like twisting a, a, a jello bar. Basically, elasticity is a uh, basic fracture combined. NPM combined with damage mechanics allows us to, to achieve this fracture. You must eat a lot of jello too, huh? <laughs> Yeah. I like eating jellos too. <laughs> bread? Yeah, bread, breaking bread. So this one has like six million particles where, um, again, yeah. I want to capture all the fibrous fracture patterns for. Uh, this is not very good quality. bread because good bread has holes at many different length scales. <laughs> yeah, this is just randomly sampled holes. <laughs> yeah, it looks a little bit like um, food cake or something. Yeah, or yeah. candy. <laughs> it looks a little better when we uh, visualize the particles. So it's uh, from blue to red, where you can actually see the small uh, fractures that's a little invisible from the rendered view. Okay, I'm gonna skip the plasticity and play more videos. Oh, more fracture. I really, I really do a lot of fracture work nowadays. So, yeah, I mean, just when I, when, whenever I see such a video in YouTube uh, with those HD, so normal cameras, I, I want to reproduce them here. So this is for the fracture propagation for pumpkins and Oreo. <laughs> this also showcases the ability of NPM to simulate just different type of materials. Uh, this is a candy crab. So here, the green thing is really visualizing the, the crack propagation in the original space. What's the minus? <laughs> All right, this still needs some work. <laughs> Fruit is missing. <laughs> okay, so more versatile physics. This is viscoplastic materials. Uh, this is done in NPM mainly to model viscous stuff like creams, foams, and sauces. So we're really um, advancing towards food simulation a lot. It's like, it's like the <laughs> and granular media, you already saw some uh, ice cream, uh, sand, and snow. It's also possible to simulate heat propagation in NPM. So, 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 so we, we solve the, the temperature evolution and associate the material properties with the temperature. Um, these are more examples for the heat. Um, we're, um, we're simulating the melting and solidification for, for phase changing materials. So you can actually transit between a solid phase to a fluid phase. Okay. These are examples for co-dimensional geometry. So, um, as especially in the fashion design industry, clothing simulation, hair simulation, and knitted cloth simulation, these are these are really important because artists want to design the clothes and uh, kind of predict what it will look like on, on person. So this is becoming a huge industry called virtual try-on. I think uh, Amazon and and other a lot of startups they are doing such things. I think eBay as well. <laughs> 
or you can just uh, scan your body with some cameras, and then you can test virtually, trying different clothes. This is a solid fluid mixture for sediment transport. Again, this is like showcase the turbulence developed uh, under these scenarios. I'm collaborating with uh, civil engineering people for validating this uh, numerical scheme. So this is a really important problem for them. And for for massive parallelism, where uh, where the most recent work we're doing is to do it on multi GPUs. So this is a four GPU, and on a single workstation. Uh, this simulation has 100 million particles, and it takes around uh, 50 seconds per frame on, on a single machine with the four GPUs. And this is this was really trying to reproduce the hydraulic pressure, hydraulic press on concrete materials. And we can also visualize the fracture pattern and the damage um, properties of these cracks. So this could be useful for civil engineering. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they do the concrete stuff all the time. And uh, so my my research on, on on this parallelism is really for achieving good, strong, weak scaling efficiencies. So as you go more and more GPUs, or if you go to clusters, you want to have a good um, scaling efficiency. That also involves a lot of specific algorithm designs, so it's, a, it's also a major research direction. And here's another example of how visual computing is used outside graphics. So we had this paper in Nature Communications where, where we collaborated with Swiss Institute for Avalanche Research. So we just took the SNOW model we developed in NPM, then um, compare with real-world experiments for crack propagation and initiation. It turns out to match extremely well. So they are now using it to predict avalanches in, in really large scale uh, scenarios, which is really common in, in Swiss. This is a 3D simulation of how a skier on the bottom can remotely trigger the crack inside the snow layer up to all the way to the top of the mountain and trigger a snow avalanche. And even, so this one is not reproducing any experiments, but we, we did this one or full-scale avalanche simulation uh, matching the experiment in Valle de la Cine in Switzerland. So this is a, a very um, popular field in, Swi in Switzerland where they just do explosions to trigger avalanches and record all this data for scientific research. Uh, so simulations can actually match this pretty well. Then glaciers carving ice um, into the ocean. This is significantly contributing to the sea level rise uh, due to global warming. And the icebergs resulting from the, the carving also lead to uh, violent tsunami waves, uh, which is a, a huge hazard for, for human beings. Um, so, we're, so after the avalanche research, we're currently looking into this for, for getting the, the ice breaking dynamics and the ocean dynamics right. Okay, this is the last one. <laughs> in medicine, we're using the, the real life simulation to generate virtual injuries. So in addition to the virtual surgery, we're using the virtual injury for stuff like ballistic impact uh, on the human liver here. And these projects aim, aim at the training softwares for field medics, and especially considering we can model the solid and fluid dynamics very well in the human body already. Uh, and this also serves at uh, eliminating animal experiments for such studies. So I think this was a DOD funded project. They're, they really want to do things like this. OK, finally, acknowledgments to my students, postdocs, collaborators, and uh, foundings. And thanks for your attention. I really hope we can find uh, some uh, collaboration opportunities. Uh, Peter, you can stop. Okay, hopefully it'll stop. Uh, anyway, thank you again. Um, and uh, I think next is uh, lunch. Um, so if anyone wants to come, they're free to. Um, let's see, Peter. Should stop. Um, so yeah, uh...